this is the first book that I read for the booktube, booktube made me series episode. That was a lot of words. This is the first book that I read and that book, that vlog. One of these days I'll get words to come out of my face in the correct way. Today is not that day. Hello everybody, my name is Kelsey and we're about to get very, very nerdy with my February wrap up. to try to get through these relatively quickly it is okay right now but it's about to majorly storm here so I'm gonna try to get this done before my light goes away and we have a very good number of books <laughs> to get through so in February I read 13 books which is crazy amazing um we're back to kind of where I usually am I feel like January I'm double checking but I feel like January oh no we read one more in January there's 14 so we're kind of back in the swing of things now um, and I had an amazing month. Like there was quite a lot of books in here that are now new favorites. I discovered some fun things. I discovered a new series that I'm obsessed with. I did some really cool vlogs. I did another booktube made me in that series vlog um, for Becca from Becca in the Books. So I'll definitely leave that above if you would like to check that out. But I, I just, I feel like I had a great month. So let's dive in starting with the stats. So like I mentioned, I read 13 books and that was over 4,303 pages and about 127 hours listened. And that was five audiobooks, one physical book and seven mixed. The age category, pretty normal for me. We had one middle grade, one new adult and 11 adult books. Genres were relatively small this month, which was kind of my goal. I like to read basically romance in February. So we read six romance, one nonfiction and six fantasy. More fantasy than I suspected, but most of those fantasy were fantasy romance, so like it kind of goes. And the ratings. We had four five star, six four star, and three three stars. The very first book is actually one that I started in January and finished on the very first of February, so I put it in this wrap up, but it was my nonfiction for January. And that was The Storyteller Tales of Life and Music by Dave Grohl. This is the guy who, he's been in rock and roll and um, that kind of vibe for a while, but he's the one who started The Foo Fighters. Um, and that's kind of where he's at now so his career is a little all over the place but this is one that I've read for very specific reasons which you will see in about a week um it's for a, a vlog of sorts and it was also to do my nonfiction for the month so just per usual trigger warnings for this book we've got drug overdose and abuse and then there is mentions of suicide within this book um because he toured and was part of the band with Kurt Cobain so when the whole thing with Kurt kind of happened. Um, there's definitely talks about um, suicide and that kind of thing. So just kind of be wary. There's not, obviously not really any detail. It's more just Dave talking about like his reaction to his friend passing away. Um, but just kind of be wary of that. This book was really interesting um, as far as a reading experience goes because I was very interested in him as a person. But the idea of like touring and rock and roll bores me to tears. Um, I don't know why. Just like the idea of like going on tour and reading books about tour, which is why books that are set kind of in rock and roll aren't books that I'm really going to gravitate towards. I kind of knew that was going to happen going into this book. I knew that I was going to have interesting feelings on it, but I was hoping we were going to get other things, which we did. So the first half of the book, I was like, this is fine. Like it was him on tour. Um, it wasn't really anything ridiculous. It was just like them talking about their time on tour. And then when we get to the middle of the book is when he kind of started the Foo Fighters. And so that's what I found really interesting. He talked about starting a band. He talked about the people in his life. He talked about um, kind of getting that band off the ground, why it was important to him, his life when he was like, he became a husband and a father and like how that played in with being part of the Foo Fighters and being on tour and that kind of thing. Um, and so like those aspects were very interesting to me and I definitely enjoyed it. His writing was interesting because he has a very artistic look at life, which is kind of comes with the territory um, with like the way he looks at music and how 
Um, he looks at lyrics and how it's important and impactful on his life and that kind of stuff. So he definitely has a very kind of like, I wouldn't say flowery writing style, but he does have a very flowery way of looking at life. I don't know if that makes any sense. I really enjoyed my time. It was a little, the one thing, I don't think I told you I gave, what I gave this, but I gave it four stars. Cause like the one thing that kind of didn't sit right with me, like let's take out the fact that the first half didn't really work, but that was to be expected. Um, his storytelling was kind of all over the place in the sense of I expected kind of more of a chronological look at life and for the first chunk of the book that's what happened he kind of like talked about growing up how he got into music how he started his first band or was part of his first band how he started touring like that kind of stuff but then once he got into the Foo Fighters his stories kind of were a little all over the place they were still kind of chronological but at one point he would talk about his girlfriend and the next moment he would talk about his wife which is the same person but it was at different aspects of their relationship so that really confused me and then at one point his daughter was five and then at one point his daughter was just being born and so it was like it, I'm sure it made sense in his head as far as like the chapters go but once I'd gotten to like let's say the last 25% of the book it felt very scattered and all over the place and I was like, very confused because at one point I was like wait did him and his wife get divorced and then I realized no he's been with her the whole time um it was just a different part of their life it was before they'd gotten married and so like that was very confusing for me so it got a little out there but I'm still glad that I read it. It was fair, a very interesting story. I liked reading and learning about his life. And like, that's someone that like, I've listened to some of his music, but I didn't really know who he was before the Foo Fighters. So it was really interesting to kind of see how he started and to see someone who'd actually been involved in a lot of bands that I just didn't realize. The next book I read was a butter read with my friend Teresa and we read Lost in the Moment and Found by Shannon McGuire. This is the most recent book in her Wayward Children series. I think it's number eight at this point. Um, and I gave this one four stars. True warnings in this book. This one is rough. There is a author's note at the very beginning that kind of talks you through it, but specifically um, grooming and gaslighting for our main character as well as parental death. So there's uh, some stuff and like I've had people reach out to me asking about like a very specific scene that like made them stop reading and I want to read you the author's note because I feel like it's very impactful and like will change the way that you look at the story. Uh, so it says, while all the way where children's books have dealt with heavy themes and childhood traumas, this one addresses an all too familiar monster, the one that lives in your own home. Themes of grooming and adult gaslighting are present in the early text. As a survivor of something very similar, I would not want to be surprised by these elements where I didn't expect them. I just want to offer you this reassurance. Antsy runs. Before anything can happen, Antsy runs. So that's our main character. Um, and that was... This this topic, while something I don't enjoy reading about, is not particularly a trigger for me. Um, so... But even I was like, oh, thank goodness, I know that going in. This, this story is one of the stories within the series where you see our character go into their world. So um, I've talked a lot about the series, but basically the series follows kids who go through doorways to respective worlds that are better for them than the, the one that they're in. Um, and sometimes they get kicked out of those worlds back into like our world. And there's a home where they can go to basically be around people like them. And it's run by a woman who went through a door when she was younger. So um some stories take place at the school, some stories don't. This one is one of the ones that don't. So we follow Nancy as she goes into her world. And her world is basically like this shop with a bunch of lost things. And her job is to go to these worlds to find lost things and keep them in their shop. And then someone will one day come looking for them. Or someone will just show up and be like, hey, have you found this thing? And then all of a sudden, this section of the store will open up that never was there before. So it's a little out there. Um, but it is dealing with a tougher subject because of that gaslighting and grooming. One thing that is, I think is really interesting with this series is when it comes to the stories where the book takes place in the world rather than at the home, I always feel like while these worlds are very interesting, there's always a lack of plot. But with this one, there isn't one. It's like there is, there's an actual plot. There's not a lack of one. And I liked that a lot. I liked that there was some other stuff going on. There was some mysterious elements about the world that she was in and kind of learning about that. That was very interesting. And I, while this is probably the toughest subject, one of the toughest subjects in this series, this book was probably one of my favorites. Not my favorite, but one of my favorites 
when it comes to going into the world because of that, because there was a plot, because there was stuff going on. It is a little convoluted, so you kind of have to pay attention near the end, but I'm, I'm always just amazed with these books and how the author is able to turn this really, really tiny thing into like a full-fledged story. And I loved it. And this book came out in January. So I actually read a book that came out this year. I'm doing better, guys. But I gave this one four stars. I don't remember if I said that. But I gave it four stars. So the next one I picked up was Mr. Perfect on Paper. This is by Jean Meltzer. I do have a copy of this, but one of my friends is currently borrowing it. This book, I ended up giving four stars. I really enjoyed this book. I think I went into it with too high of an expectation because while it wasn't a disappointment and it wasn't a letdown, the matcha ball was definitely better in my opinion. So this book follows our main female lead, Dara, who is the owner and CEO of a dating app called JMate, and it's a dating app for Jewish people. So it's where they can find other Jewish people. And so she's in New York City and she ends up going on this show. Um, I can't remember what it's called, but um, it's like a good morning kind of show. And the host there is Chris. And so one of the show is kind of one of Dara's coping mechanisms when she's really stressed, she just kind of keeps it on. And so when they're on the show, she brings her grandmother on because her mother and her grandmother is kind of like um, her family has been matchmakers for a very long time. She's just the first one who's done like a dating app with it. And so she brings her Bubba on to kind of like, you know, showcase the look it's multiple generational kind of thing. And her Bubba goes completely off script and shows a list that Dara made when she was drunk one night, which is the perfect Jewish husband. And so Chris comes up with this idea because that, that video goes viral. And because of this idea where he teams up with Dara and they do like a series of stories where he's trying to help her find the perfect Jewish husband. And then of course, through that, the two of them become very, very close. This book deals with generalized anxiety and someone who like suffers from it pretty roughly. And the way it was handled in this book, I thought was incredibly well done because there's this very specific scene. It's our main female lead who suffers from it. Um, and while I, it's very easy to kind of brush under the rug with some books um, or to have the main male and love interest kind of like not take it very seriously and then that could be an issue later that's not what happens our main male lead the first time they really have a conversation she kind of has a panic attack and he's just there for her and you have this like internal monologue in his head of he's like okay I want to help her but I don't I know that like if I touch her some people who have panic attacks that's a big no for them so he doesn't touch her but he's like trying to figure out a way of like being able to comfort her but he's going through this internal monologue of like okay so this probably isn't a good option. How about this? Is this a good option? Okay, maybe I'll do this instead. And so he just kind of like sits there and is like, I'm here if you need me and just kind of like lets her um, deal with it. And then him being there is comforting to her. And I thought that was so important to put in a book because um, it's very, it's very easy to see someone freaking out and then do the normal, like, just breathe through it. And that's not helpful in the slightest. And so to have someone who kind of knows what they're doing. And then throughout the book, her anxiety clearly plays a huge part in the story, especially because one of her big things is not being in front of people. And this book is basically about her being on TV. Do you see the importance of Judaism within Dara's life specifically? And then you see, you also see like, Chris, Chris is a single dad. And so you've got him dealing with having a teenager for the first time and not really knowing what to do with that and kind of dealing with the loss of his wife, even though it's been a handful, a good number of years, it's still hard and um, what that does to a kid. And like, there's a lot of really tough subjects within this book, but their romance is just so cute and it feels very realistic. I liked the flow of it. I felt like that, you know, kind of, it made sense for them. Um, there's definitely the big old cheesy moments as well. It's a romance, you're going to have the big old cheesy moments. But just like with the Matzo Ball, what I loved about this book is that, or basically this author, I think it comes from being this author, is that she is so good at having all of those perfect, romantic, hallmark, rom-com vibes that you want from a romance, but doing it with the same conversations of like these tough conversations of having anxiety, dealing with it, losing your wife, losing your mother, like that whole conversation is really, or this multiple conversations is really hard. 
And I think she does a very good job of blending the two. So um, I just definitely like Mott's Ball better, but this one was like still very, very good. The next book I picked up was another buddy read, and that is The Hawk by Monica McCarty. This is the second in the Highland Guard series that I'm reading with my friend Taylor. We are reading one of these every single month. There are 12 in the series, so we should be done by the end of the year. The series basically follows a bunch of guys who have been picked to be part of this Highland Guard. It's at the time period um, where this guy named Robert the Bruce is trying to free Scotland from English rule, and so he has the secret guard that like not really many people know about and they all have nicknames so like no one actually knows who's in the guard except for the people who are in the guard or the people who are married to the people in the guard and so this one follows a guy named Hawk who his real name is Eric um but he is a good seafarer like he's a a big big guy there um and then you've also got our female lead Ellie who Basically, what happens at the very beginning of the book is she stumbles across this secret meeting between Hawk and some other people, and they freak out and kind of kidnap her and bring her to their land, um, one of the islands, and she doesn't know who they are, they don't know who she is, she kind of plays herself off as, like, a nursemaid, even though she's, like, relatively high royalty, I can't remember, oh, she's, in fact, Lady Elaine de Burgh, the spirited daughter of the most powerful noble in Ireland, that's what it is, so she's a high noble, but she plays herself off as a nursemaid, and he plays himself off as like, okay, well, if you'd gone with other people in this group, they would have killed you. I'm just only going to hold on to you for a hot second until the, the like there's like this big war, not war, but like there's a battle happening. And so once the battle happens, then we'll let you go. Now, she doesn't know there's a battle. She just knows that there's some reason that she's not being held or she's being held. And so like, but she's not really... It's this weird situation where it's like, yes, she was kidnapped from her home, but she's not like a prisoner. She's not being held hostage in the sense of like, she's bound up or anything. Like she's just taken to this island and told to kind of like, hang out. And like Hawk goes and hangs out with her and like, takes her on excursions of this island as they get to know each other. And like, it's the two of them kind of falling in love. So it's a, it's a weird situation where like, it starts interestingly, but then like, it, it's, it's not as bad as I'm making it sound. Anyway, what this book was much better than the first one. We both, I think we both gave it four stars. The lights have come out because the sky is very dark. Okay, so as I was saying, this book was much better than the first one. Um, and we both think it's because of the world building that was needed in the first one to make this series make sense. Fine, totally get it. But that didn't happen in this book. And this book primarily focused on the main couple kind of learning to love each other. And they both have secrets and they're like, not they're obviously talking about their secrets because of one reason or another, or another and it's just very well done and I liked how it ended um because it's just like I don't know like one of the moments was just really sweet and um it was just a lot of fun <laughs> so it was I don't really have a lot to say about it because like it was very good I very much enjoyed it but there's not really anything specific about the plot. There's nothing really specific about the writing or anything like that that makes it like the next best book of all time. But it still was a lot of fun and I still really enjoyed it. The next one I read was To Marry and to Meddle by Martha Waters. And this one ended up getting three stars. So I adore this series. I adore this author's writing. But this one specifically fell just a little bit flat for me. And it was entirely because of, I think, the relationship between this couple. So we follow um, Emily and Julian, and Emily's father has a big debt. So there's none, she's been like kind of on the market, let's say, for a while. And there's only one person who's been interested in her, and it's because he can get rid of the debts that her father has. Um, now, granted, the debts are because of this man, but that's neither here nor there. And Julian is the owner of this um a theater that is known for being like the place where men take their mistresses but not their wives and he wants to change the way that people view this place and so he marries her in the hopes of like she'll be like the good wife and like help him give credit to this place and like more people will bring their wives instead of their mistresses and like that kind of thing and she just wants freedom and does not want to marry this man um that her parents basically have forced upon her and she's always just done what her parents have told and that now she's like screw that and so um they get into a marriage of convenience for that reason and what i loved about this book is you really see emily come into her own she is very kind of like i said she just kind of followed what her parents told her to do she never questioned it she always did it she didn't 
question whether it was in her best interest or not. She just did it because her parents told her to. And now she's had time to kind of like look back on her life and realize like, okay, so maybe some of the stuff that I've done, like specifically hanging out with this person, um, is not the best for me. And there's some like secrets and stuff that her parents have not told her about and be dealing with said debt. And so she's just kind of like, all right, fine. And stands up for herself for like the first time ever. And I love her for that. She is so strong willed and I love it. But I just like, there was something about the romance that like it, it didn't fit really in the sense of like, they both had like they both wanted to have a stereotypical marriage like they not stereotypical they wanted to have a traditional marriage in the sense of like yes they married for convenience but they still want to have kids they he still needs an heir like all of that kind of stuff so like the physical side of their relationship is great from day one and because of that that like clouds some stuff with him and he just won't listen to her and she won't tell him what she's really thinking and there's that whole like miscommunication situation it's not really miscommunication but it does fall under that umbrella where they just aren't talking about their problems and their feelings and then when they do it's very abrupt and out of nowhere so their romance aspect of the story felt like there was nothing going on and then very very rushed all of a sudden so that aspect which is the main part of the story just kind of fell a little flat but there's a lot of banter between the two of them Emily is very sassy, but she kind of hides it because she's always kind of had to. And he's the first person who's really been able to see it besides her friends. And so um, they have very fun conversations that I just loved. But the progression of the romance just felt off in a few places. Um, but I still really enjoyed the story. I still love this author. She's still a very funny author. I'm still going to keep reading things by her because I, I'm very obsessed with the series. But I went into this one, I think, with too high of an expectation, and I think that made it fall a little flat. The next book is probably one of my favorite books from this month. It's one of my favorite books of the year so far. Like, I am obsessed, and that is The Spanish Love Deception by Elena Armas. This is the very first book in that vlog that I mentioned at the beginning. The next episode in the booktube made me series the one following Becca. Now this book she hasn't actually read. It was kind of like G's video where I had one book that I bought because of her but she hadn't read it yet and this was said book and I gave it five stars. It was amazing. I loved every second of it. So there are a couple of trigger warnings which so just be aware um sexism a lot of sexism within the workplace specifically one guy just being a dick the whole time um um they should just talk about dieting so um diet culture and that kind of thing if that's not your thing and then there's a little bit of uh, like i don't know how best to describe this but um slut shaming in a sense i mean that's not it but there's some stuff that like happened in our main female leads past that um people made her feel bad about because she was the female and didn't do anything about the guy in the relationship. It was a whole thing. Anyway, this book follows our main character, Lena, um, or Catalina. And this series, or this book kind of starts off with her and her best friend talking. Um, her sister's getting married. She's the maid of honor at her sister's wedding, and it's in Spain. Um, and she... Her ex-boyfriend and his new fiance are going to be there. And so because of that, she's made up this boyfriend a while ago for her parents. And they suspect or expect him to come to the wedding with her. And she doesn't want to go to this wedding alone. And she also doesn't want to, like, tell her parents that she and this boyfriend that doesn't exist broke up. So her coworker, Aaron, um, who they do not get along, kind of agrees to go with her as said fake boyfriend. And my favorite thing about this book is the progression from enemies to friends to lovers is so seamless and there's not like it's just it's very realistic and I loved it I loved this book I'm obsessed with this book I tabbed a lot of this book especially later on um and you really see their relationship because I suspected when I started this book that it was going to start with them agreeing to go to Spain and then immediately go to Spain. And that's not what happens. They kind of create this bargain where she's going to do something for him as well. And so it shows them in the workplace and then they go to Spain. So like they've already pre-established like a friends thing before they even get to Spain. And I loved that. This banter 
between them was amazing. I understand why people say that if you liked the hating game chemistry between that main couple, you would like this one because it's very, very similar. Honestly, there are aspects in this book that I wish is how the hating game started. Specifically with them at work, it's more professional and more realistic in this book, whereas the hating game, it just felt like there was a lot of HR issues that was never discussed in the hating game. And that's not what happens here. They kind of like make sure that there's nothing like that. They just don't really get along, but they do it in a professional way. And I appreciated that. Um, but the banter, the banter is everything. I love their conversations, but also the tension between these two is so good. Like this is not particularly a steamy book in the sense of like there's a bunch of sex scenes because that's not what is happening here. It's more like the build up is so good that like by the time it happens, you're like, oh my gosh, finally. Like it's just... I loved it. I loved it so much. I am very interested in, there is actually a second book in this series that follows um, the best friend of our main lead, Lena, um, her best friend, and actually Lena's cousin, I think, is how that's connected. And I am very, very interested in that book because um, this was so good. I feel like that one's going to be amazing. I just couldn't put this down. I This is like not a small book either. Like as far as romances go, this is relatively thicker. And I felt like it needed, that's the exact length it needed. It didn't feel too long. It didn't feel too short. It felt perfect. And I read this in like two days um, because I just could not put it down. I was utterly obsessed with the story and it's now my new favorite. And honestly, something has to be so, so good to just like blow this out of the water because like this could very easily be a, a contender for like favorite of the year. It was that good. The next one I picked up was The Love Hypothesis by Allie Hazelwood. I also gave this one five stars. I fell in love. Uh, trigger warnings for this one. There is sexual harassment slash assault um, near the end of this book. So just be aware of that. Um, but I loved this. This was such a good story. So this one is one that's pretty popular. So I'm sure a lot of people know about it. But we follow our main characters, Olive and Adam. And Olive is a PhD student. And she, basically her best friend, she went on a date with a guy and her best friend really, really likes him. And so she doesn't care. Like she could care less about this guy, but her best friend is like, no, 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 we're best friends. I can't date him. And so she's like, okay. So she makes up this date as like a, no, 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 I've moved on. You can date the guy that you actually like. And so her best friend's like, oh, okay, thanks. And then she gets caught in her lie. Um... And so she ends up kissing this guy named Adam, who was one of the professors, one of the PhD professors, not hers, just one of them. He's also a well-known, just like complete ass and no one likes him. And he's nothing but sweet to her. And it's just so fun. But they basically strike up this fake dating relationship because he is trying to get a grant and they're concerned that he's a, what's called a flight risk, which is he has no nothing tying him to the place he's got no kids no wife no kind of like family in town so they're afraid to give him this grant that he might just up and leave and so he they kind of fake date to get her friend off her back but also to help him look like he's got ties to the area so they'll give him this grant and um some lots of other stuff happens but I love their relationship because like it's very easy to have a hate to love where he's just a complete jerk to everybody but then um, he's like softens throughout the book. Whereas with this one, it's it's not that way. It's like that's the way people perceive him. But he's nothing but sweet to her. And it is the cutest thing ever. And I love their relationship. And it's very, very nerdy. So just kind of like be aware of that. Not in the sense of like there's a lot of pop culture references. That's what I expected going into the story is I was told or I'd like I'd seen a lot of reviews of people saying like, oh, it's very, very nerdy. Like they mentioned Star Wars on the back here. It's like well-known fact that this is like Kylo Ren, that kind of fanfic turned into a story. And it's really not like there's not really a lot of pop culture references that I noticed. It is nerdy in the sense of like they're both scientists. So like when they start talking about experiments, that kind of like goes over my head but they do it in a way that like makes makes sense like they kind of dull it down for you which I appreciate but there's definitely moments in this book where um they kind of both go down like a rabbit hole and they're talking about like experiments and stuff and it's just right over my head but that's really about it like I don't think that this is particularly pop culture nerdy stuff if like that's not your thing and that's what you're worried about 
I, I didn't see any of that in this book. I This was another book that put me on like the edge of my seat. I could not stop reading it. I was obsessed with this book. I want to read the rest of the books by this author. At this point, she has a couple of other STEM romances. I don't think they have to do with each other. They're not part of the same series, but they just deal with women in STEM, um, which is really cool. And I am excited to see how that's going to go. So lots of sciencey talk, but that's really about it. But I loved the chemistry between the two of them. There's so many cute moments. The tension is definitely there from day one. Um, not to the same extent, I think, as the Spanish Love Deception. That one's a little bit more, but this definitely has its tension in its own right. And I'm obsessed with this author and I love this book. It's just so good. I then picked up the first two books in the Bridge Kingdom season series, which is The Bridge Kingdom and the Traitor Queen by Danielle L. Jensen. I was only going to read the first one, but when I talked about this, I talked about this more obviously in that vlog, but um, when I talked about this in my TBR, I wasn't quite sure how the, the series worked. And um, one of you lovely humans told me that it's like a series of duologies. So there's six books in the series and only three are out right now. So the first two follow these two main characters, the second, the third book, and then the fourth one when that one comes out follows another set and then the same thing with the last two. So I only read the first two in this series. I became very obsessed with this series, but um, I decided the way that this one went is it felt like one story split into two. So it, you kind of needed the second one. It, it kind of ended on like a pretty decent cliffhanger. So I decided to jump into the second one and then not start the third one until the fourth one comes out. And then I can read those two together. But I gave the first one four stars and the second one four and a half stars. So they both got within that four star range. I loved it. Um, so trigger warnings for this one are like the normal like torture. There's some gore and it. it's a fantasy romance. So you're going to have that kind of stuff. Um, there is some gaslighting and manipulation from like a parent within this book so just kind of be aware of that but the biggest things in my opinion were like the violence and gore and that kind of stuff which comes with the territory of being a fantasy book I fell in love with them this is amazing I don't know why this got me heart and soul because this book is pretty tame as far as stories go in the sense of like it's not the most amazing fantasy romance I've ever read in my entire life it's not the most amazing fantasy I've ever read in my entire life but it was still so so good and I loved every second of it and the relationship between Laura and I think his name was Arden is how you said it I always get his name wrong um was so good so this world basically you have a bunch of like villages and kingdoms and then there's this bridge kingdom that is literally a kingdom on a bridge also on a bunch of little islands and they because of where they are they kind of control the important export of a bunch of different countries and so they're thought of as really really wealthy and like everybody wants to control this kingdom and so our main character Laura has been trained her whole life um, to basically be an assassin in a sense um, and a spy so one of the daughters it turns out it's her basically goes to get married to the king of the bridge kingdom as like there was a treaty that was created I think it was 15 years prior to the story and so he kind of calls on that debt and one of the daughter's princesses goes and it's Laura and she has been taught how to kill people she's been taught how to find information how to be also a stereotypical wife with her like allures and that kind of stuff to kind of get him interested in her so that she can steal secrets and send them back to her father and his um council so she comes to the the bridge kingdom and obviously things do not go quite as planned she learns some stuff about the world as a whole that her father probably didn't want her to know about um and then of course there is a relationship that blossoms between the king and her so this was so good um I really just fell in love with the characters it is a relatively shorter story so I think that as far as the romance goes it might have helped it if the stories were a little bit longer but there was a lot of plot happening the first book primarily focused on the romance the second book while the romance was part of it it primarily focused on kind of the political plot side of stuff that was going on so definitely a political fan fantasy if you are more interested in that but it's definitely a good book if you are trying to figure out if fantasy romance is for you if you're trying to figure out if political fantasy is for you because it's very I don't want to say surface level because that's not it, but it's very easy to understand this world and the story, especially if you have like the ebook or like a physical book. Like I had the ebook and there was a map and that helped a whole lot because I am just so bad at visualizing 
worlds, especially fantasy worlds. And I could visualize this one so well. And the map helped a lot. And so that's like saying something because it's very easy where I will just like skip over um, the world building kind of things when it comes to like location wise, like physically showing how the world is together. I, I could draw it now. Like I know how the world fits together. I know the different types of people and there's a bunch of them and why they're important. And that usually doesn't happen. So this is pretty good at being simplistic enough without being like simple um, to help you understand the world. So again, if you're trying to figure out if political fantasy is for you, this is a good book and series to try out. Have the second one on deck because you're gonna want it. Um, Cause again, cliffhanger. And it was, it was just very, very good. I enjoyed it. And I'm definitely going to keep reading the rest of this series um, as they come out. Like I said, the third one's out, but I'm waiting for the fourth one to come out, which doesn't even have a title yet. So um, it'll be a hot second, but I'll read those together because if they're like this one, I'm going to want them right away. And I don't really want to start a book where I know the end is going to be a huge cliffhanger. So um, I just, I love it. It's so good. It was just so, so good. <laughs> The next one I picked up was the first volume of Rat Queens, and this is by Curtis J. Webb and Rock, Rock Up Church. Um, this first volume is called Sass and Sorcery, and it basically follows these four women who are part, they're basically this adventuring group kind of thing um, called the Rat Queens, and it takes place in this village where um there's a bunch of them and they are it says right here they are booze guzzling death dealing and battle maidens for hire and so the book starts with them and a bunch of other groups like them basically being hired to do a bunch of stuff for the city because people are tired of them just being drunk all the time and hanging out in the city so they go do stuff for the city and it um backfires because there is an assassin out to get them and so they're trying to figure out what's going on I actually gave this one three stars because it's been a few weeks, a couple of weeks since I've read this book and I'm still a little confused on my thoughts on this one because on the one hand, the plot was very interesting. There's that whole mystery with trying to figure out who is, you know, who hired these assassins, why people are trying to kill them. And it ends on a cliffhanger that is very interesting that makes me want to continue. The plot is very interesting with the story. On the other hand, I can't stand the characters. These four women, specifically the one in charge, which is Hannah, drives me nuts. I can't stand her. And honestly, I can't figure out why people would follow her. She's so annoying and rude. And so like, you've got a plot that's interesting, but you've got characters I can't stand. And that's where like, I'm confused. So I do actually have second volume of this in print. And I found the rest of them on Hoopla. So I'm, I'm going to keep continuing with them. It's not the top of my priority TBR right now, but I will continue like, oh, I could fit this in for like a readathon or something like that. So I will continue as long as they are continuing to be interesting, but I don't know. I just like these characters are so rude. So I find that particularly hard to read. And then on the other hand, so like trigger warnings for this for like violence and gore. And I say trigger warnings, like be wary because with it being a graphic novel, you're going to see it all. Um, and if you are new here, hi, hello, I hate gore. It makes me nauseous and uncomfortable and I can't read certain types of books because of it. But with this one, there was just so much of it that it was almost comical and how much was going on that I would just like, it didn't phase me at all. Like there was moments where like they would show someone's arm that was no longer attached and I was like, okay. And I moved on. Also, they have a character in here that heals a bunch of people and, um, I didn't really trust that anybody was actually hurt because she just healed them. And I feel like there's just, I don't know, there's some stuff that's going on that I'm like, that feels like cop out a couple of times. Anyway, um, yeah, it's super gory. And that usually is a huge turnoff for me. And I would immediately stop reading a book because of that. But again, it was so much that I was just like, this isn't affecting me in the slightest. Like, you know how like, Something you're like overstimulated, so like it doesn't affect you. That's kind of the way that it felt. Um, so I'll continue, but I have very mixed feelings about this still. Okay, the next book is the other book that's probably my favorite book of the month. I can't decide between this one and a Spanish Love Deception, but I think this one wins, and that is Fortuna Sworn by TJ Sutton. I gave it five stars, uh, trigger warnings, 
violence and gore, um, slavery. Actually, there's a huge list at the very beginning here. So I'll just read you that because there's a lot of them. So it says, please be aware this novel contains scenes or themes of slavery, profanity, spiders and eating disorder, sexual harassment and abusive relationship, violence, cannibalism and animal death, sex and murder. So um, there's a lot going on there. Now, some of those, like she says cannibalism, but like I... There's one scene specifically that I'm thinking of that maybe I just misinterpreted that could have been that, but it's not in that book a whole lot. So I don't know. It's like not on the page. Anyway, um, just be wary of those things. That's why I think she said um, content and themes because like slavery is big in here and eating disorders talked about an abusive relationship. That's a big one as well. But like, for example, some other things like uh, profanity, spiders, I think they talk about sexual harassment, but I don't think it's on the page. I think it's more themes of it and, like, the sense of, like, it's a fairy court, so, like, they're not going to be nice to humans. Just generally be aware of that. But, like, a lot of that stuff is not, like, on the page situations. This book was amazing. Um, it follows Fortuna Sworn, who is a nightmare. And basically what that means is she – it's like a type of being, like, an elf, a dwarf, a fae. Like, it's a type of – person it's not necessarily like yes there's a skill with it like it's just like it's a type of creature I guess if that makes sense but she's human um so I don't really know how that works but basically what that means is that if she touches you she knows can kind of like read your mind and figure out what you're scared of and then like make you see that and so her brother has gone missing a couple of years ago and she's kind of been searching this whole time but never really found anything and this fae shows up and basically is like, oh, I, I know where your brother is. I can help you um, get him out and, and take you to him, but I need you to marry me. And she's like, that's a weird thing, but okay, fine. And then he, she takes, she's taken to like um, the fae court and it's a lot of rough, rough situations because the fae are real, real rude and real mean. But I love this book. It's perfect for fans of the Akatar series, in my opinion, especially the first book. There's a lot of stuff at the end of the first book that is reminiscent of some of the things within this, but like this seriously took me heart and soul. I have reworked my my planning video planning schedule so that I can finish the rest of the series in the next, hopefully in the next few months or so, because like I I'm so obsessed with this series. I was trying to do this thing where I was going to figure out if this was for me and then I was going to wait until all of the books are out because right now according to Goodreads there's six. There are four out total. The fifth one's coming out in March and then the sixth one's coming out at the end of next year. So we've got some time to wait but um, I don't think I can do it. I think I'm too obsessed and I think I need the rest of the series now. So this is going to be my new obsession. Um, 2023 is the year that Fortuna Sworn takes over my life. So just kind of be aware that that's coming in this year. I do apologize. I will talk about it a lot because I, I don't know how to explain to you how obsessed I got with this story. I read this book within a couple of days. I couldn't put it down. I fell head over heels in love with these characters and I don't, I don't know. Um, and I know I'm in for some mean things that are going to happen just because of the way that I've seen Becca and Ashley both reacting to the books because they've both read all the books that are out right now. And I know it's going to be tough. Like there are some things that are going to, I don't know what they are, but I know there are things that are coming that are going to be really, really tough to read. But I'm obsessed and I know that her writing gets better and I don't see, like there's not, in my mind, there's nothing really wrong with this writing. So the fact that it's going to get better, I'm just... What does that mean? I just, oh, I'm so obsessed. Um, so yes, this solidified for me that I love, I love fantasy romance. And um, if you have any fantasy romance recommendations, let me know. Because while, yes, there are books that I have read that fall under the fantasy romance umbrella, um, I haven't read that many. And that's not like Sarah J. Mass. So I need more. So give me all the recommendations because this is my new personality. The next one was a reread. So this is going to be kind of an interesting 
conversation because I've already talked about this book. Um, and that is Romancing the Duke by Tessa Dare. This is part of her Castles Ever After series. This is the first, I believe, in that series and one of the last books of Tessa Dare that we have not read in this buddy read. This is the very first Tessa Dare book I ever read. Now, I read this like a couple of years ago and way before we even started the Tessa Dare buddy read. So this, like I said, is a reread for me. I gave it five stars then. I haven't changed my mind. It's still got five stars. However, having read it before and now having read all of Tessa Dare's books, I think that there are other books that are better than this one, but this one's still got five stars. It was really nice to dive back into a story that honestly I'd forgotten a lot about. There were parts of it that I remembered, so it was cool to be able to remember certain scenes, but as far as like going into it, I had forgotten a lot. This book follows our main character Izzy, um, Izzy Goodnight, and her father is the per is like a big author. A lot of people know his fairy tale stories called The Good Night Tales, where he basically in the stories he he the narrator um, is reading fairy tales to his young daughter Izzy. So a lot of people know Izzy because of that. Her father has passed away, so she is kind of trying to find some money because she's basically left penniless, and she is told to um, come into this castle, and she's going to be given some inheritance from this old guy that like um thought very highly of her so she does and she gets there and realizes that there's actually like a duke there his name is ransom and um she's given this castle and they didn't realize that the duke was still there um and so there's this like battle of wits between the two of them because she's like oh no but the papers here give me this castle and he's like no but i never sold this castle and so there's a lot of issue and um, but it also um doesn't help that he was injured very very badly so he's blind and he needs her help to kind of figure out what's going on so she stays and is kind of helping him um come back from being like when he got hurt he kind of like permitted himself away and so she's trying to help him kind of get out of that a little bit um as the romance blossoms and there's a lot more to it than that but I just I love their chemistry the banter is perfect this is what we expect from a Tessa Dare book it's funny it has all of the moments I laugh out loud every time I read this book um and their relationship and chemistry is fantastic there's also a conversation of Izzy kind of being um two-faced is the best way I can describe it because she puts on a face or a mask for like the followers of her father's work and that's not the face that Ransom sees and so it's kind of that conversation of like let them see the real you and that kind of stuff but it's perfect for people who like fairy tales and stuff like that because again with all of those um her father's stories it's going to be in there so I just loved it it was really fun to dive back into this story and get back to the Tessa Dare that we know and love and I hate that we're so so close to the end but also like what an accomplishment that like we are so close to finishing all the Tessa Dare books crazy but yes I have read this one before but it was fun to dive back in and the very very last book that I read in the month of February was my middle grade book and that is the second book in the Percy Jackson and the Olympians series by Rick Riordan and this is The Sea of Monsters so this one I ended up giving three and a half stars to and I think it's because I'm reading these as I'm older and I didn't grow up with the Percy Jackson books so they probably fall a little flat for me because of that only because I've, I've, I'm reading it at a different time but because this is the first time I'm diving into these stories even though I know what Percy Jackson is I think again not the target audience so um, I think I have a little bit of a disadvantage there but this series is one that I'm sure many many people know um I feel like it's hard to not know what this series is we follow Percy Jackson who is a demigod which basically means that one of his parents is a Greek god or goddess and he goes in the first book he goes to this camp called Camp Half-Blood which is full of demigods because there are monsters and forces out there that are trying to get rid of all the demigods because they do have powers um and they have the ability, some abilities. So the first book, he goes to this camp and kind of meets a bunch of other people who are demigods, discovers who his father is because that's, um, his mother was mortal, but he's trying to figure out who his dad is and um, some other stuff that's going behind the scenes. And this just continues on from that. I will say this suffered, in my opinion, from, there's, there's a difference when you have like a book that's inspired by Greek mythology or a book that's just straight up retelling Greek mythology. So there's some aspects in this book that are basically based on the Odyssey by um, Homer. 
And it didn't feel like we were reimagining it. It felt like we were telling the same story with different characters. So like there's, there's a whole scene with like the Cyclops that just felt like Rick Riordan was rehashing the Odyssey without giving it a different tone, if that makes any sense. I mean, there were hints to the original where they talk about it and the hints of like the Cyclops remembering kind of some of the aspects from when Odysseus was there, but like it just, it didn't feel original in any sense. So like that's why that particularly fell flat and that was a good chunk of this book. So while I do enjoy the Percy Jackson series to an extent of like, I really like having this Greek mythology being retold in different ways. This one specifically, I think, fell flat because it didn't feel like it was any new information. It just felt like the same myth, but like with a different character. I don't know how to explain it, but it just it didn't feel original. So I think that's why it suffered, but I'm very interested in the rest of the series. I'm going to continue with this. I'm hoping to read one every month for the next few months because I would love to get through this series. I feel like it's about time that I actually finished it. So that's what we're doing, and I just happened to read this one next. So expect to see Percy Jackson, um, the rest of the series, show up a lot here <laughs> because I am going to get through it. And then I'm thinking about starting the other mythology series is that Rick has. So I think there is a second series that's kind of like a spinoff from this one. I don't know. I have to do some digging to figure out how all of that works together. So this might be the, the year of Rick Riordan just because a lot of his stuff looks interesting. But this one specifically fell flat, but I'm still very excited about the rest of the series. And that's it. This was not the quick video I hoped it would. I had to get the lights out, but that's okay. I hope you guys enjoyed the wrap up that took 10 years. But I hope you guys enjoyed this video. As always, let me know if you've read any of the books that I mentioned in today's video. If you have any good fancy romance recommendations, let me know. If you understand the Percy Jackson series better than I do, let me know because I'm trying to figure out what to do um, next. If you have just any good recommendations, let me know or let me know what you read in February that you just absolutely loved. But if you like this video, and I very much hope that you did, don't forget to give it a big thumbs up and subscribe down below if you'd like to be part of this awesome growing family. I've also got all my social media down there, as well as other fun bookish links, so check all that out, and I'll see you guys in my next video. Bye!